Hi, and welcome to Conversations with B'nai B'rith International. I'm CEO Dan Mary Asher. Thanks for spending some time with us today. If you enjoy our conversation series, make sure you never miss an interview by subscribing to the B'nai B'rith YouTube channel and liking us on Facebook. And be sure to visit our website, b'naibrith.org, to learn more about our work across the globe. Born in post-war Czechoslovakia to Holocaust survivors, Hadassah Lieberman and her family immigrated to Gardner, Massachusetts in 1949. She built a career devoted largely to public health and eventually became part of the upper echelons of American political life. In her insightful and moving new memoir, Hadassah, An American Story, she shares details from her extraordinary life, why she considers herself a symbol for immigrants in America, the importance of faith and family, respect for tradition, and so much more. We're fortunate enough to have Adasa with us to talk about her book and to reflect on her incredible journey thus far. Adasa, thank you very much for being here. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you for inviting me. I'm so pleased to be with you with B'nai B'rith this morning. It means a lot to me. Well, thank you. Thank you. We're going to start where... It's, it's the usual author question, uh, but it's an important question. What prompted you to write an American story? Well, you know, I wasn't, I never thought about this at an earlier point in my life. But then as the years were rounding and I had all these stories accumulating, I finally sat down and said, I was so lucky to be in this position of having been an immigrant and of having gone through life and then meeting my husband who became this politician that I wanted to remember my parents' story, my story from them and to write it because it's an important thing to think about, not to forget, but to remember memories that are truly part of all of us whether we're Jewish or not Jewish, it's an important story to repeat. Well, after reading the book, uh, I felt I really knew you. I think any reader would find that to be true. From your rich life experiences to the way in which you relate to your loved ones, uh, I was especially struck uh, by the beginning of your story, uh, which begins not with you, but with the experiences of your parents in Europe and what they endured in the camps, your mother being in Auschwitz, your father in a forced labor uh, brigade. Um, Tell us about your parents because you devote a chapter to each and and they seem like they were two people who really complemented each other well. Well, you know, you complement each other. They got together. They didn't know each other. They didn't have families left. They met after the war was over. My mother was from Rachov in the Carpathian Mountain area. And Joe and I were invited to go to where our families were from. And so I ended up in her town, Rachov, because he was involved with some important things that related to the areas that we're from. And so we went to Rachov, which she always described as a beautiful little town. No Jews left. Whatever Jews were there were all taken out and gone. And I found her old home where someone lived. They had bought the home and taken it over. They weren't Jewish. They were part of the culture there, but eradicated all Jews. My father wrote his book, in the area that he's from. And it's just an amazing thing to follow through to your parents. After all, my father went to yeshiva at the age of five, walking in the snow, staying with an uncle. And these were the stories that came out of them and sleeping on a stove top in the midst of the winter. And my mother being this beautiful woman in the Carpathian Mountains. And then all of a sudden, the story she told that we found later as I was cleaning through the garage to bring her things together and 
to throw some away and to keep some others and to give many to the Holocaust Museum. And when she talked about how she, her house was taken over by the Nazis, when they came in and they started to go through all the papers and she was sitting just watching them and she didn't know what would happen. And her mother had said to her from the World War I, she had remembered things were not so bad. They won't be so bad. In the meantime, they didn't have the CNNs. They didn't have the TVs to tell them what was going on. By the time they were pulled together, it was 1944. You know, it was a later time, and yet they were all taken out of their homes. And so my mother said, these were memories she never forgot. But who knew that they would be taken out and set in a small encampment and then shipped to Auschwitz in trains? And she relates that story in the diary that I had translated from the Holocaust Museum a translator from that area who translated in this beautiful English that was better than the English I knew my mother could speak. So I learned about her background and about her being pulled out together with everyone and how they just were on top of each other. The stories, you know, with time, you look back and they're more and more amazing because they're so shockingly awful that you can't believe people would do that to each other. And yet it's happened and it continues to happen in various ways worldwide today. That's what's so sad. Well, you, you quote extensively from her diary and um, her experiences as she related them you know it's it's interesting you know we we think we've read everything there is to read uh, about the holocaust and every every personal memoir is different and uh what your mother wrote there uh was very detailed uh and and frightening um and it speaks of course um later on to to the tremendous resilience that she had as a, as a young woman uh, to all that was going on around her. Uh, your inspiring American story uh, was shaped by what you encountered on the day of your arrival and your childhood experience in, in Massachusetts. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, and we've talked about this, I was raised not too far from where you were. You were in Gardner, Massachusetts, and I was in Keene, New Hampshire, about 30 miles wow. north. Talk to us about your first memories of your living in America um, and what still resonates with you? How did your parents, for example, how did they react uh, to their new country? And uh, were you always aware of the differences between them and the parents of, of other children that you were growing up with? Oh, yes. Well, you know, being from Keene, we were in, you know, these American small places and they were truly the American you know, you felt the Thanksgivings around you, all the stuff, and the clothes were different. And I, my first recollection through my parents was that my mother used to always say, the Statue of Liberty, when they came ashore. And before we came ashore, my mother said, everyone's sick, everyone's vomiting. And Hadassika, is dancing with the captain of the ship. I was only nine months old and I was fine. So we finally got to where we needed to go. And first we ended up in New York as many of the um, immigrants at that time. I never heard what it was all about. I never heard what my dad did to make a few dollars. And here he was ordained as a rabbi and also a lawyer and just didn't want to talk about what he was doing. So I never asked, I never learned. And then we went to Gardner, Massachusetts, where I remember I was a young girl. And I remember one of my friends from there said, oh, you were dressed in a little coat and so firmly conservatively, you know, because there were certain ways kids dressed and certain ways kids didn't dress. And they put me in a kindergarten I had to learn the language. I went to school and everyone was speaking English. 
And I remember I came home and my mother said, how was the day in Yiddish? And I said, mommy, no more Yiddish, only English. And I yelled it out. And it's that time that we as immigrants all know. And that's really what all immigrants feel. The parents are left with the accent and everyone. And so I had my little friends who would say, oh, your mommy talks so nice. And that meant it was different. And sure, my mother, my parents were different. I was a different person growing up from all the others. And uh, my mommy didn't want me to have my hair wild the way they had it to be braided or in a ponytail. And there were certain ways she wanted me to dress and she didn't like these pants on girls. You know, it was all this stuff. And my best friend across the street, Patty Gallant, was a Catholic. And she knew, oh, I always remember your house on Shabbat. I learned to say Shabbat Shalom. And I would do things sometimes. I would turn on lights and I realized that you don't do certain things. So it was just an um, incredible. And then my father on his tape recorder, because he had to deliver sermons to his gardener congregation. And so he would be on the tape recorder recording his pronunciations and writing these wonderful lessons to give the congregants, but working hard on his language. So having a language difference, that's a fundamental problem to all immigrants. And we have to understand that of others who don't speak the same languages. So I learned to look at American society, my kindergarten time, there was this basket. And if you were good in kindergarten, the teacher had this big basket and she put it up in the air and let you pick something out of it. So it could be a little play dolly or a play truck or a lollipop. And I never had anything like that. That was like a true American way of living to get those free little things in a basket. So it just, you know, good times, really. Well, let's talk about your your career. Um, Went to school in Boston. um, And then you um, really entered some very interesting um, uh, areas uh, uh, where your your background and your interests could really flower. Discuss some of your accomplishments and touch on some of the milestones that have defined your professional life. And and tell us really about the important health network initiatives uh, that you developed uh, with Israeli medical personnel, for example. Yes, well, there are so many different recollections. And really, I went to Stern College, which was part of Yeshiva University for two years. I didn't go to Boston University right away. And why? Because my daddy was touring BU with me. And he started walking through the lobbies and the dormit near the dormitories and near the administration offices. And he saw couples sitting together, and who knows, kissing, whatever. He said, not for you. And I, I had to... Um, apply to Stern College, Yeshiva University, and he said, you'll go here for two years, then you can go back, because I wanted to study communist China. I was intrigued by Mao and the Chinese and the population and everything that was happening, and I couldn't do that in Stern at that time, but I did then go to BU and learned how it is to be in this big co-ed university, which had so many different things. And then I went on to study European international relations and things of that sort, my master's in Northeastern. And so some of the stuff that I did, I went, they chose me to go first after the year of my year of college to go to Israel on a special program to understand some of the tough things that are going on in universities 
with some of the people coming from the Middle East and speaking to many students in a negative way toward Israel. And what should you say and what should you do? So that that educated me as to what was going on. And it was scary because you really need to combat things. And I learned, and you know, it was really to try to work with some of the students on the far left anti-Israel group. And we were concerned with making sure that Israel's true reputation came out to people. And as we know, how you guys, B'nai B'rith, adamantly helps us in that regard. And I went on to explore different things. And in the process, I joined the Coleman Cancer Group of Breast Cancer and ended up helping them set up their work that occurred in Saudi Arabia. And I was involved with Brazil in particular, where we launched things for women who didn't have money and weren't in the vicinity of hospitals. So we really worked together on trying. And then we actually did two years of a march for breast cancer in Jerusalem. And that was amazing. And it happened that my husband, who was in the vicinity, was able to come and join us for the march with the mayor of Jerusalem at that time. And it was very exciting because when we turned around and looked at this group of people in the same parade, they were in the parade to combat breast cancer or survivors of breast cancer. And they were Arab Israeli, Israeli, American, from all over Europe, anyone who was there for the years studying in a college, in a university, or working in a laboratory, they all marched together. And it showed me how international cohesiveness can sometimes occur when people work together, as women in this case and some of the men who had survived breast cancer. But we work together and speak the same language about survival and health, even though it might be in many different languages. So I felt proud that I was able to work with Nancy Brinker and all the people involved at that time. Well, you um, you write about your divorce and your remarriage and the blessings of a blended family. So tell us uh, about Joe Lieberman. How did you meet him? And how were you able to mesh your lives and careers? Uh, he was in Connecticut. You were in Riverdale. Um, how, did, how did that all come together? Well, not easily. <laughs> but what happened was... I did get divorced, and I did write about it, not in terms of the individuals involved. And I'm respectful. Former spouses are part of what you've developed up to that point, a son. And he had two kids, son and daughter. And so you learn that respect is the most important thing, and that's a gift to give children. Because every time you have a social event as a family, you don't want to bother it. You don't want to kill the peace, the harmony that should come from that. So Joey and I, well, what happened was my girlfriend, who was my roommate at Stern College for Women, and then she was a person who shared my living space in Boston University. She was in Boston studying. She said, I want to introduce you to a man. And she didn't really know him so well. It was just in her synagogue in New Haven. And she said, but he's a nice guy. And I think that your son, Eitan, and he looks similar. And I thought, what a way to introduce me to someone. And anyway, I said, okay. So she said, why don't you come up for Shabbat to New Haven and meet him? So I came up to Shabbat and... 
he came over. I was sitting in the backyard. It was a nice sunny day. And I met him and we talked to each other. And then he said to me, well, um, what are you doing tonight? Well, obviously I I wasn't doing anything. I was visiting my friend for Shabbat. And then he said, well, why don't you come with me to um, a political event I have to go to? And then after we'll go out. Okay. So I said to him, how will you introduce me at a political event? He said, don't worry, as my driver. So I thought, wow, this is the beginning of politics. Okay. So I got there and he said, this is Hadassah. She's my Hadassah uh, Tucker, who's my driver. So I thought, gee, interesting. And then our date started at midnight because, of course, you're the other part of Connecticut. You can't get back to town. And we were sitting at a place in Connecticut talking to each other. And we had a nice chat. And But it was late. You know, if you start your date at 11, 30, 12, of course, it's going to go till later. And the place was closing. So I went to my girlfriend's house with him. And we sat in the downstairs den, whatever, and talked about, and when you've, when you've been divorced and you're, you sort of talk, you have to introduce each other geographically. And we got to learn more about each other. And then around three o'clock, he had to leave. And he said, oh, I have a political event in Hartford in a few hours. So I got to leave. So I said, Okay. And he said, I'll call you. And then he ended up calling me and I was living in Riverdale, New York. And he came down to visit me. And the only thing, my son was there with me. He lived with me. And I wasn't, well, I wasn't going to bring him to my parents who had moved in close. And so I got a babysitter to sit with him in one of the other places. and. It was an interesting, and it was Passover time. So when Joe, he always recollects better than me about this, when he saw my tinfoil on the counters and my music and my this and that, he said, oh, this is, this is my kind of woman. So we started dating and got married not too long after, after the campaign for his attorney general race, which he won. So we decided we'd get married after the campaign. Well, let's uh, fast forward to July um, of uh, 2000, Nashville, Tennessee. Um, There's going to be a big announcement that day uh, that um, Senator Joe Lieberman is going to be, uh, it's been asked by Al Gore uh, to run on his ticket. Um, I can tell you uh, that Republicans, Democrats in our community made no difference. Uh, we were so proud uh, of that of that day and that announcement, and of course of, of Joe Lieberman. Um, you spoke that day. It was a hot day in Nashville, uh, making this announcement. Uh, you spoke that day, and you you talked about the meaning uh, of this this momentous occasion in terms of of your own personal context and and your Jewish context. So tell us a little about that. Well, that was, you know, part your first question, why did you write the book, ties in here um, and your story of Keen. I, I get emotional because, you know, this was a, a different past and it was my background. And all of a sudden, here we are, in Tennessee, and I remember standing up there, and we had some family members in the back, and I turned back looking, and I was smiling, because what a momentous moment. Following my history, the death in my family, the so far from this American moment, and this amazing time that my husband is going to be introduced as the vice presidential nominee. And so that was a moment where I had to 
talk about me. And I had talked briefly about it before with Al Gore. And he had said to me, you need to, you need to introduce that. You need to talk about that when you introduce your husband. And that hit me because, you know, you're an immigrant. You don't necessarily start talking about yourself and start proclaiming your differences. When he said that to me, I was very touched by that. And so I started in my remarks to talk about my differences and in the context of being an immigrant and to talk about this for all the immigrants, for all the people who came here. And I wasn't just a woman introducing my husband. I was also an immigrant. And I talked about being a Jew because that is part of my historic context. And yet at the same time, I included others. You know, I'm going to introduce this one thing. I remember the dream that they would win, that this ticket would win. And that part of what I wanted to do is Joe and I and many um, traditional Jewish families bless their children on Friday night. And I had wanted to introduce that. Yes. However, whatever your religion is, if you have a Friday Muslim Sabbath, a Shabbat, a Sunday Christian, and on and on, you put your hands on your children's heads and you bless them. And I wanted to talk about that in a unifying way. And I was happy that when we were on the campaign, we would get together and one Shabbat, we ended up in a hotel in a community that had a rabbi. And we went to that show. We walked through the streets and all these people, it was Saturday, were having their weddings in their homes and came out and said hello to us. And even Shabbat Shalom, some people who knew nothing about Shabbat per se. And we walked to Shul and I said to the rabbi, do you always have such a full congregation? And he said, no, and never, uh, not until it's a Yom Kippur and we don't have it, but you guys are here. So they all wanted to come. And again, it was a unifying moment with Jews who were Orthodox, who were Reformed, conservative. Again, another point that so frequently we lack today. And we need to work together as immigrants, as natural born citizens here. And we need to respect each other all the time. Well, during that campaign, I just I'd like to add you spoke before the B'nai B'rith International Convention uh, in yes. Washington, and uh, were were very well received uh, that day. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, to move to uh, a very important date. We we happen to be, um, even though these programs, you know, once once they're in the ether, they're there forever. Uh, so we usually avoid putting dates, but we're we're doing this program two days before Holocaust Remembrance Day which is January 27th. Um, in 1995, so it's 27 years ago today, 27 years ago today, you arrived in Warsaw. You were asked to be a member of um, the delegation, the official U.S. delegation, attending uh, the uh, commemoration of the liberation of, of Auschwitz. And you write really very movingly in the book uh, about that day and all that happened. Um, tell us a little about that. Well, I remember being chosen by Clinton's person who was doing the choosing and announcing it to go on this trip. And I thought, oh, my God, what am I going to do with my little one at that time and leaving with Joe? You know, he's got so many things to do in the Senate. But I had to go. I called my mother and she said, why? Why do you want to go to Auschwitz? Are you okay? Are you safe? And I was 
That was an interesting response. And I decided, yes, I'm going. And I spoke to people, survivors who I know and others, and went to Auschwitz, which, and Elie Wiesel walked in with him and others. It was a moment. And here I was, the wife of a United States Senate United States Senator from Connecticut, and I was able to go through him. And it was the most remarkable trip going into Auschwitz and seeing some of the things. And I hadn't read my mother's diary yet because I read it after she died. And I remember she told me about the latrines, about, you know, all this awful stuff. And then there I was watching it, seeing it, and listening to people like Ellie and others talk about it. So I was shocked by everything and simultaneously proud that my family, that my mother had me as the survivor to come and witness this as an American, as the wife of a U.S. senator. So everything I do, I felt, was through those veins that circulate through my body, for sure. And we came together, and it was very special for all of us and very important. And the Holocaust Museum has been an important place that commemorates and helps us move forward. Despite the fact that there are more and more younger people who obviously don't know anything except what they've read, what they've seen in films. And so we have to be very careful to keep those memories alive in a positive way. What do you, um, in that regard, what do you make of the current and deeply disheartening spike in anti-Semitism. Uh, I mean, over the last 22 months of the pandemic, uh, we've seen a lot of it, but it's of course, for the last 15 years, we've seen a steady increase. Uh, what What's your take on all of this? Really, I don't like to say that it's it's fearful to look at. I just, I don't like when you learn the history, how things came about through speech. It came about through writings. It wasn't that everything happened overnight. It took time to change people's minds. So of course, those of us living through the trauma or being descendants of the trauma can't believe we never thought we'd hear this in the US. And I wonder, and we have to always wonder, if that is because the computer is binding these people together and making it appear as if it's all over the place, when it might really be in one basement here, another basement there, but it gives these people a chance to unify with horrifying negative others who think the same way and feel strengthened because they have others to communicate with. So I choose to believe that and hope to believe that. And we have to keep going forward to eradicate, to work with people and to understand if you teach your children or grandchildren hate about other people in the society, or in their class, or wherever you're teaching it, it grows. One person tells another person. So it's an obligation that we have. And places like B'nai B'rith seek to eradicate, seek to learn more about it, and work in opposite directions to guide people out of the pitfall of that hatred. Well, let's uh, close on a more optimistic note. Um, I'd like you to reflect uh, on your American story. As, as I <clears throat> read the book, 
<clears throat> I, um, this is a classic immigrant story, but it's a very personal story. Um, you come here, you're one year old, your parents are survivors. They wind up in New England. Um, you get an, an education like, like so many others in, in your generation, our generation in the Jewish community, build a career. Um, not only marry a, a much beloved uh, member of our community, uh, but a, a much beloved political figure in, in Senator Joe Lieberman, uh, having a window on, on American political life. Um, this can only, as they say, only in America. Um, what, are, what are your reflections? My reflections are that I have been very lucky because I am a descendant of this past, and yet I now have, uh, I think it's 12 grandchildren, four children. So, you know, for, as they say in Hebrew, Baruch Hashem. And I am very lucky, and I have healthy children, some of them living closer than others, a daughter who immigrated to Israel with her boys. And, you know, my recollections of things is the memories I have from being in a national campaign and simultaneously being able, looking, going through, I will never forget the U.S. in the center of the U.S., I recall, a bunch of women in particular, shaking my hand. And I don't know if they were Democrats, Republicans, independents, saying to me, we like you. We like your husband. And some of them are saying, he's a religious man. We like that. And we wish you luck. And that bonding I had with people, we felt it across the country. And later, international trips when I accompanied my husband. There was such a, a bonding and an understanding of how we care about family, how we care about community, and how we have to take care of it. Tikkun Olam, repairing the world, means starting with our own selves and our small circles and the community at large. So what I remember most vividly, and that's because I am blessed with a husband. What you see is what you have. This is a clear straight shooter. I have been blessed to marry. And he really has tried to help in Tikkun Olam, in trying to broaden our circles and to be together in a faith-based way, in ways that respect each other's history. And each of us has our own languages. And the U.S. has really been a very, very special place for me. My parents loved America. And I tell the story in the book that when I wrote a story on loving democracy. It was one of these competitive things in high school at that time with all the high schools in Massachusetts. And I won it, won it. And then I remember on one of the Memorial Days going in this white convertible with the congressman and waving. And so there were my parents. They always went to the local, you know, it was celebrations of these kind of Memorial Day, you know, all that. And I remember going by them and waving my hand and I had tears in my eyes. And it was a moment. And you understand when your parents are from somewhere else that we're it. We have no choice. And that's what I was taught. You have to move forward. You have to really keep that spine straight and create a good impression and have people understand you may be a smaller population but you must teach who you are with strength. Well, the book is Hadassah, An American Story by Hadassah Lieberman and is available wherever you purchase books. Hadassah, thank you so much 
for joining me and sharing your experiences as a child of Holocaust survivors, your American success story, and your contributions to American Jewish and political life. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for being so wonderful. Thanks. Well, thanks again to Hadassah Lieberman for speaking with us and talking about her new book, Hadassah, An American Story. And of course, to all of our viewers, thank you for tuning in. If you enjoyed this conversation, make sure you never miss a program by subscribing to the B'nai B'rith YouTube channel, liking us on Facebook, and following us on Twitter and Instagram. And be sure to visit our website, B'nai to learn more about our important work. For my guest, Hadassah Lieberman, and for B'nai B'rith, I'm Dan Mary Ashen. See you again soon.